Welcome to The Waves, Slate's podcast about gender, feminism, and what my guest once called the tyranny of vanity. Every episode, you get a new pair of feminists to talk about the thing we cannot get off our minds. And today you've got me, Julia Craven, a journalist with eight years of skin in the game, who is also a senior writer and editor at New America. Later in the show, I'm going to be joined by Elise Hugh, the host at large based at NPR West and the author of Flawless, Lessons and Looks and Culture from the K-Beauty Capital. I'm really excited to speak with Elise today because her new book, Flawless, takes a deep journalistic look at the way perfection and hustle culture, and really capitalism, has oozed over into how we perceive, care for, and present ourselves to the world. Being conventionally beautiful is a time-consuming process that takes a mental and emotional toll on women globally. It's also incredibly advantageous to be considered beautiful. Pretty privilege is a real thing. I had a lot of questions about how we interrogate this reality while understanding that we aren't above participating in it. For me personally, I've been into beauty since I was a little girl, and I have very fond memories of watching the women in my family get ready to go out whether it be to the grocery store, to church, wherever. It was captivating to see my Nana, for example, apply her favorite red lipstick and jewelry, or to watch my mom slick her hair back into a ponytail. And I waited for the day that I would be able to do the same. What I didn't know was that the women in my family were adhering to Eurocentric beauty norms, even if those rituals brought them joy, in order to access the one privilege they had, being pretty. We're Black and from the South, so, you know. I had a lot of questions for Elise about how we interrogate this reality while understanding that we aren't above participating in it, and really that we can't be above participating in it. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, me and Elise are going to get into the nitty-gritty of beauty culture. See y'all in a second. Hey, Waves listeners, if you're loving the show and want to hear more, subscribe to our feed. New episodes come out every Thursday morning. And while you're here, check out our other episodes, too, like last week's about likability and how unlikable female characters are finally getting their flowers. Hey there, Waves listeners. Before we get started, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later in the show. It's from our partners at Macy's. For over a decade, Macy's has partnered with The Trevor Project, the leading suicide prevention organization for LGBTQ young people. From June 1st to 30th, you can support The Trevor Project by rounding up your Macy's in-store purchase or donating online. Stick around to hear from Sophie from The Trevor Project. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm Julia Craven, and I'm joined now by Elise Hugh. Elise, welcome! Thank you. I'm psyched to be here. I'm excited to talk to you about your book, which I thought was incredibly fascinating and very, very relatable. One recurring theme in the book that I found incredibly relatable was the labor of being beautiful and how time consuming and exhausting it is to be a woman who is expected to chase these unattainable beauty ideals as if we would ever catch them anyway. To me, it gave hustle culture, it gave wake up and grind vibes, and you mentioned in the book that this fuels burnout among young people in Korea. Yeah, whether it's primping or plucking or waxing or shaving or dyeing or dieting or just researching products to buy or making appointments and figuring out which med spa to go to. This is a lot of time that we are spending on aesthetic labor. It's not just labor that we are doing for free. It's labor that we're actually paying to do. And I think so many of us just passively participate because we've been doing it since we were teenage girls, you know, and then it's also sold to us as empowerment so often. Tell us about lookism. What is lookism? Because I think that might be a word that people have experienced, but maybe they haven't heard it explained before. Yeah. So add to the isms of sexism and racism. They're all intersectional. They all interact with one another. Lookism is basically discrimination on the grounds of your looks. So if you've ever been teased for your hair or what you were wearing, 
or just how you look, nose, skin, whatever it is, that is lookism. And in South Korea, this is a pretty well-known term because it's such a societal norm. Passport photo businesses will Photoshop your image by default. Parents will gift cosmetic surgery to high school students. And so many hiring folks will require headshots on resumes because your looks are so tied into professional success and personal success and just getting into rooms. It's really framed in a society that is lookist. And ours is the same. Ours is also lookist. But I think that we try and paper over it with talk of like body positivity and everyone's beautiful, but then still still give people who are pretty a privilege, which means as we narrow the ban for what we consider pretty, then we are only widening the ocean of what's considered unacceptable or ugly. And that's what's really worrying. Um, but yeah, it's working on your looks in a lookist society then is essentially situated as a matter of personal responsibility. Like, you need to look good, looks matter. And so why wouldn't you do the work to try and look better? And I just find it incredibly marginalizing for those in underclasses who are never going to be able to pay the amount, spend the amount of money or time or afford so many of the services that get us to closer to that perfect ideal. So it's incredibly marginalizing and isolating. It's a recipe for inequality, but also it's a recipe for anxiety and exhaustion across the system. Because no matter how close you get to the ideal beauty of the moment, you're not going to feel like it's enough. And even if you are, you know, one of the gals on Selling Sunset, let's just say, which I live in Los Angeles, so that's kind of an ideal beauty in Los Angeles for the moment. Those women seem like they're kind of in a state of constant maintenance of having to keep up. And so you have anxiety and exhaustion across the system. You have huge inequality. You have marginalization of every body that doesn't fit. And then the more and more of us that participate in this kind of hustle culture that's reached into our bodies, then the more narrow that beauty standards become, which is only going to feed more anxiety and inequality. Right. And so all of that struck me as very capitalistic, especially the ideal face, um, since you have to conform if you want to acquire capital, which is another time suck. But we see this broadly. We see it in Korea. And so what does this say about our society's desire for ownership over well-being? This is the neoliberal dream, right? The, the idea that you can make yourself some sort of entrepreneur and that if you're completely self-reliant if you spend enough money, if you do enough consuming of whatever's in the market to improve yourself. So it's like you're buying and you're consuming at the same time. You are also being consumed by society as an object. And I just found South Korea to live out the very ideals that that America also tries to export all over the globe in kind of a souped up way. <laughs> and this all did, this is tied to economic precariousness. Um, this all came out of the 1997 Asian financial crisis in South Korea, where unemployment skyrocketed, South Korea went bankrupt and had to pay back billions and billions of dollars in loans from the interna International Monetary Fund. And so the government sought other ways to find economic engines or just tried to find other economic engines, period. And one of those was the Hallyu Wave, which was banking on visuals, banking on exporting K-pop, K-drama, K-culture in general. And then with the exporting of those visuals, you also exported Korean aesthetics and beauty ideals. And then when they did that, they were also exporting and advertising plastic surgery and lasers and wands and facials and cosmetics and skincare in order to get there. So this was all part of a project to try and pay back an IMF loan originally. But the entire society got caught up in it. Because then everybody's trying to compete, not just on how educated they are or how capable they are for the job market, but when you are competing 
for jobs and labor, you're also having to compete with your outer self. You've We have conflated good looks with morality, and we've conflated good looks with working hard, such that if you don't fit in, like if your body is just never going to fit in to the ideal size two, which is the shape that Korean women are supposed to be, then somehow you're considered lazy or incompetent. And we see that in the United States with fat phobia all the time. It's like fat people are supposed to be to blame for their size when that's not, there's no science that indicates that's true. Right, exactly. And so let's actually get into blame because I think that it's so fascinating because it's like you said, all of these things intersect and our society blames people who are not either white men in you know good shape and wealthy or who aren't white women who are thin. So if you're black, if you're Asian, if you're a size six or a size 16, if you're poor, you get blamed for not fitting into these ideals that you could never fit in in the first place. And so I would love, especially like in terms of the human body, which has like such a deeply sordid history in the Western world when it comes to our bodies and ownership. And I just think it's really fascinating to see this playing out, like you said, in kind of a souped up way. And so what what can we learn from this? Like, I know that's like a very final question of the interview, but I just want to know like right now, what can we learn from this? Beauty has always been a performance of class. So it is intricately tied to hypercapitalism. And that's what I saw in South Korea, but it is true universally in any sort of capitalistic culture or system. And when you situate looks as a matter of personal choice, these are, this is not a victimless crime because all of us become collateral damage. We are internalizing really toxic ideas like that fat people can't be happy or poor people can't be happy or that children are less lovable if they don't look exactly the right sort of ideal cuteness because of their size or their shape or their skin. The way we've tangled up health and happiness <laughs> with good looks is so problematic morally. And I think more and more of us are getting caught up in it in an increasingly visual and virtual society. And so I write this book as kind of a reflection of my recent past, but also I'm we're trying to time travel forward to look at the possibilities of what that could mean as we move more and more online, as we get more and more sort of augmented reality and move into metaverses. Yeah, I thought your connection to surveillance culture was fascinating. It was interesting to see someone connect the way we perceive ourselves to just like these broader issues that are going on in our world. And so I thought that the connection to surveillance culture and how in the most disturbing instances, it was connected to how someone looked and wanting to consume how someone looked. But it also felt connected to just women not being perceived as human. I'm talking about the mocha. Oh, gosh. Yeah, mocha. So mocha is the Korean term for s hidden spy cameras. South Korea, <laughs> I didn't even know about this phenomenon until I moved there. But there is just a network of tiny pinhole cameras that are placed in women's dressing rooms and public bathrooms and in random places so that they can upskirt. They're placed by just regular people. You could be a teacher, you could be a bus driver, you could be somebody who works in a hotel, and you could be one of these Molka type people where you're just placing secret spy cams all over public spots in order to catch women in various states of undress or in private moments. There's also this big revenge porn problem where women are filmed a lot in sexual moments. And then that footage is served up online. There's a demand for it. And so spy cams have been, it's basically functionally legal to do this because it's these crimes aren't prosecuted or they they go so rarely prosecuted. And so women in South Korea do not feel safe. They do not feel like their bodies are their own so often as they're moving through their days. And that sense of always being surveilled plays into 
how free we feel, how much bodily autonomy we have, and whether we feel safe in our own bodies. And I tried to link all those things together, but it is an epidemic. There has been more and more attention on the MOLCA problem because of the work of women activists, but it hasn't gone away. Now I want to talk about Choi and Lee's experiences, because those two, they struck me as two different facets of the white supremacist patriarchal endgame of these standards. And so, you know, for folks listening, Choi was called a darkie and an ape for having a complexion the color of sand. And Lee, who is trans, was bullied by Terps and other feminists for passing or adhering to the beauty standards for her own safety. And so for Choi in particular, I felt sad reading that section, um, particularly seeing how she internalized those things about herself. She actually, you know what she said to me? She said something like, that I don't even think they were trying to be mean. They were trying to be helpful. So it's kind of framed as an act of friendship or in the case of if your mom is picking you on you for your looks, some sort of maternal love to try and get you to improve your looks. Because it's also socially, often it's socially unsafe to be in a body that doesn't fit in because you're going to get bullied or you're going to get discriminated against. So I think a lot of parents kind of accurately or pragmatically conclude, all right, I'm going to have to get my kid to look better. I'm going to have to help my kid lose weight. I'm going to have to help my kid um, stay out of the sun so they don't get too dark. I'm going to have to get my kid eyelid surgery so that they have bigger eyes or more desirable eyes so that they can get the better job, so that they don't lose out on opportunities, so that they are able to date and maybe get married if they want to. And it's just an adherence to this rigid beauty culture that continues to uphold the beauty industry, the same structures of power that have always been in place, and then it's self-perpetuating the more people adhere to it. Right. And I definitely saw the what you said about looks as safety. Being able to look a certain way leads to you having a sort of societal safety and financial safety even, but also just like being able to walk down the street. And so that's why Lee's story really stood out to me. And It just felt very um, fucked up, really, that anyone would bully her for wanting to look a certain way so that way she isn't harmed. And so it's like that conflict, it just struck me as in Choi and Lee's experiences both, just it doesn't matter what we do. It's just it's never enough. Yeah, women are ridiculed for trying to pay attention to the one thing that society says they should pay attention to, their looks. But then they're ridiculed if they don't pay attention to their looks. It's this very, very, very thin tightrope that you're supposed to be able to walk, where you adhere to beauty culture and try to look a certain way, but that you don't try too hard. You're supposed to affect effortlessness out of a whole lot of effort. The whole no makeup makeup look is called gyu on gyu in South Korean or in the Korean language. And it just means decorated, not decorated. So you are supposed to do the work, but you're supposed to look like you didn't do it at all. Which it then makes us more invisible. It not only makes the labor invisible, which is a, just a recipe for all sorts of angst and anxiety, but then it also makes us more invisible. We're going to take a break here. Make sure you check out our Slate Plus segment today, especially if you're a Succession fan. Today's very special plus is going to be Slate VP of Audio Alicia Montgomery and Slate Executive Editor Susan Matthews talking all about Shiv Roy and that (laughs) decision. You don't want to miss it. And please consider supporting the show by joining Slate Plus. Members get benefits like zero ads on any Slate podcast, no hitting the paywall on the Slate site, and bonus content of shows like this one. To learn more, go to slate.com slash the waves plus. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Lene I'm a writer, creator, and a changemaker. 
And the first step in making meaningful change is talking about the really hard things. Did you know that LGBTQ young people are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers? Macy's and The Trevor Project are on a mission to change that. The Trevor Project is the leading organization doing crisis intervention and mental health work for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning young people. My name is Sophie Goode. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior corporate partnerships manager at The Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is a suicide prevention organization. The work that we do is very serious and it's very urgent. As much as we see a bright future and see the opportunities to make change, we know that LGBTQ young people are in pain and in danger right now. And support from Macy's empowers us. We've expanded our crisis services from just having the phone line to also having 24-7 service on text and chat. We've increased our lineup of suicide prevention programming as well. Working towards the world we want to create and making sure that we're showing up for young people in this moment is so important. Now's the time to help LGBTQ young people in crisis. This June, Pride Month, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, you'll help fund the Trevor Project's comprehensive approach to suicide prevention among LGBTQ young people. Find out how Macy's is creating brighter futures for all at Macy's.com slash purpose. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. It's so easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and to never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. But when we spend all of our time giving, it can lead us feeling stretched thin and burned out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. I think a lot of people can benefit from therapy. I personally have been in therapy for multiple years. It's been really great for my mental health to sort of have that designated time to reflect on what's been going on in my life and to have a sounding board. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash waves today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash waves. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and the Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. Get comfortable, like Clarence Thomas on a conservative billionaire's yacht comfortable, and tune into Crooked Media's Strict Scrutiny to stay up to date on the latest Supreme Court decisions. I'm Leah Littman, and each week I'm joined by my co-hosts and fellow law professors Kate Shaw and Melissa Murray to break down the latest headlines and the biggest legal questions facing our country, from Mifepristone to trans bans. With the 2024 elections approaching, it's crucial to understand the impact of these decisions and how to fight back. So listen to new episodes of Strict Scrutiny every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm Julia, and I'm with Elise, and we are talking about beauty culture and capitalism and sexism and racism and lookism and how all of that shit is really unfair. The first part of our show was we went into some really, really deep systems, and now I want to talk to you about another part of your book, and this is the sticky part that I really enjoyed you investigating. Why is it important for us to interrogate these systems while understanding that we are not above them or above participating in them? Because I think that's key. Yes. And the reason why I wrote this book, too, is because beauty is something that I find really fun and uh, alluring a lot of the time. And it's kind of a thin line between what I enjoy and want to take part in. And then feeling like I'm on a hamster wheel of having to keep up and sort of perform for the eyes of other people. And so it's a duality that it's so worth interrogating because all of us 
take part in it in one way or the other. You know, we have bodies and then we are on screens for the most part and for often for most of our days. And we're quite seen, you know, in terms of our faces, right? Like our, the face is the front of shop. And so I don't think any of us can avoid it. And I just worry that we don't think about it enough as a matter of politics, that is. I don't think we think about how political it is and how much it intersects with larger systems of labor. And so the worst thing we can do is just like passively go about without being aware of all the ways that our bodies are sold to and then objectified or parts of larger machines like economic machines. And I still, this isn't, the book isn't a polemic. It's not like, hey, everybody should be an escape the corset woman and shave their heads and stop wearing any makeup. And I, I what I want ideally, is for us to opt out if we want to opt out or opt in if we want to opt in, but not all chase the exact same kind of Instagram face or now it's metaverse face ideal because surely that doesn't match up with <laughs> everyone's desires. There was some study that shows that kid that showed that kids as young as three start learning their preferences for what is attractive from their peers, from other people. What humans find desirable tends to be what other humans find desirable, and that happens very, very young. And so the more even teens and kids are fed ideal images, the more we want to chase them, and the more we think that's attractive, and we think other kinds of skin or shapes or hair or sizes are not attractive. And that is just so anathema to the diversity and the richness of the human experience. So I love, I love beauty. I love skincare. I love everything about it. I love getting dolled up. It's fun. And I've always thought that it was fun. And I think that's because I saw my Nana and my mom and like my great grandma, like I saw them get dressed up and I saw them like put on their jewelry and put on their lipstick. And there, it was something like very ritualistic and beautiful about it. And so... I wonder if just like throughout this reporting, you maybe not, maybe solution isn't the right word, but how do we participate in these things, these rituals, these beauty rituals that we love, while at the same time not beating ourselves up on those days where we don't feel like doing it and just not feeling compelled or like we have to do it? Fundamentally, we have to break the link between external appearance and worthiness. The big overarching problem is that too many of us are defined by our, our appearance and that if we look good, somehow that means we have a good life. And if we don't look good, we assume that that person doesn't have a good life. That is what we actually have to think critically about. And then from there, we can take the time and set our own boundaries and recognize and reconcile the tension of beauty for each of us personally. But at the very least, we shouldn't just reinforce out-of-reach beauty ideals passively because, like we've talked about, time and money matter. And then you mentioned the word ritual, which I think is so important. Just as I've remapped my relationship to work as a millennial where I've set boundaries and I no longer respond to slacks at any hour and I cannot be bothered on the weekends, we can also remap our relationship with aesthetic work and figure out all right, I'm going to take a beat and figure out what actually feels good to you and feels like it's a ritual and you're wanting to do it and you can continue to do it for the rest of your life instead of seeking a result or putting on a costume. So I have a kind of a test for myself, which requires a kind of quiet and taking a beat and resting. And it is asking myself whether the practice or the procedure or the treatment that I'm participating in feels like it's ego driven, like I'm doing it for someone else, or I'm doing it to look good, or I'm doing it for the gram or whatever, versus soul driven, that I feel more connected to me, like I am more Elise when I do this. And that can, that test is something that you can apply only if you're really listening, listening to you and listening to kind of the essence of who you are. That was really beautiful. <laughs> And it also, it makes me think about the relationship that so many women are 
trying to have with self-care, right? Where it's like, we're not doing this to post a reel or to, or hopefully you're not doing it for that reason or to post on TikTok. You're doing it because waking up at 5.30 and going to the gym and getting it out the way and having coffee, that just makes you feel good. Like that makes you feel good about your day. It makes you feel good about yourself. It's not because you're, you know, upholding some type of ideal. So I really love that you made the connection between like, is this for my ego or is this actually for me? Is it actually feeding my soul? That was so beautiful. And I hope millions of people hear that. I'm wondering if at any point during the course of your reporting, did any memories from your own childhood pop up? Because I remember the story my mom told me about how right after I had chicken pox, like I had just recovered from chicken pox, and I looked in the mirror for the first time and I saw the scarring on my face and I just like, w- like just burst into hysterical tears because I was just like, oh my God, I'm ugly now. And that to me at 30 years old, I think I was like maybe four or five at the time. And so at 30, I'm just like, this is terrifying to like be that young and realize like, oh, my skin, to one, realize that my skin isn't perfect. And two, to realize that it matters that young. And so I'm wondering, like, did anything from your own like childhood come up while you were doing this book where you were just like, oh, my gosh. For sure. For sure. Because we learn, we, we start tying our physical appearance to worthiness or a lack of worth so young as your memory showed you. For me, it was also blemishes on my skin, but blemishes on my legs because I scar really easily from mosquito bites and mosquitoes love me. And so when I was little, I would often kind of scratch my mosquito bites and they would leave scars. And I was so taunted by the other little boys, the little boys on my street that I would go riding bikes with. And they would they would ask me if I had chicken pox. So it's similar and related. Um, and... I just remember sort of being ashamed and feeling like I had to cover up. And this is that idea of covering and really really having to cover up anything about yourself that you feel is stigmatized. But all of us very young, I think, become victims of lookism. Of We get made fun of or bullied for our appearance quite young. And then we are aware of what people see as our flaws and then internalize those flaws as something lacking about ourselves. And it's so heartbreaking for that to happen in these formative years because they stay with us. You're 30 now and that memory still comes back for you. And I'm 40 and those memories still come back for me. And it's taken me so long. It's taken my entire adult life and doing so much of this reporting to try and untangle this and feel really worthy in my body and not spend a bunch of time in front of the mirror. And I think it's so important that I do and that I do this work and that I am kinder to myself and that we should all be kinder to ourselves because I don't want to model the same kind of trauma or angst about my body or bodily shame to my kids now, which is what I think happened with our mothers and our grandmothers because they were constantly passing down certain ideas about being pretty or the importance of being pretty or being presentable or girlish because they were operating in a time period where there were so so many fewer choices I think for women and so it was really logical that they have to behave a certain way or be ladylike or pass in whatever way they needed to pass and I just think at least now in 2023 we should celebrate that the hard-won freedoms (laughs) and choices that we have, even though there's still a long way to go. And one way to do that is to not play into these ideas of what being a girl or being a woman is supposed to look like, if we don't want to. Elise Hugh is the author of Flawless. It is out now at your favorite local bookstore. Elise, thank you so much for being on the show. I am delighted to have been on. Thank you for having me. It was so fun. That's our show this week. The Waves is produced by Shayna Roth. Daisy Rosario is Senior Supervising Producer. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us at thewaves at slate.com. The Waves will be back next week. Different hosts, different topic, same time and place. Take care, y'all. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Matthews, executive editor of Slate. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for being a Slate Plus member. Since you're a member, you get this extra weekly segment today. Alicia Montgomery, our VP of audio, and I are going to be talking about Shiv Roy. Hi, Alicia. Hey, Susan. How are you? I'm good. So I think that before we get to the actual finale, maybe I just want to ask you, what was your relationship to the character of Shiv? You know, I got PTSD every time she came on screen. (laughs) Because if you're a, a woman in a workplace and you're a feminist, there are all these women out there who are sort of Um, what, feminists for kicks, for play, for the moment that it helps them and are just as ready to to cut you off at the ankles and stab you in the back in the boardroom um, as any man. And so I have sort of um, a love-hate relationship with Shiv, which I think a lot of feminists do. And um, what was your relationship with her? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that for a long time, I was wondering if Shiv could be the person I was rooting for. Um, Like one of the things that I think is really amazing about this show is that all three of the siblings are such fully realized characters. And we talk about this in Slack at Slate all the time, like who's rooting for whom and who, who the Kendall girlies are, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel like I never I never joined the Kendall train and I was always kind of bopping between Shiv and Roman who are so opposite but it was like almost the same thing of like Shiv is complicated and she she has this interesting backstory where like she did leave the family and she had kind of her own career that was at least ostensibly on her own merits and she has ostensibly the right politics. And there are all these things about her that make you want to root for her. But then when you see her actions, like particularly over the course of this season, her politics are so incredibly negotiable. So I was always interested in her as a character. I always kind of wanted to root for her and was kind of intrigued by a a show that would position her as actually succeeding. But I think that the main thing that I felt this this season in particular is that it just kept on propping Shiv up as the example of why women are so handicapped and, and cannot be successful in this kind of particular world. You know, that's interesting, Susan, because one of the things that always from the beginning bothered me about Shiv was that she seemed to assume and lean into the idea that her being a woman made her sort of special and refreshing in terms of being a leader of the company. Because, you know, her brothers spent their whole lives, it seems like, you know, sniveling and groveling and working their whatchamacallits off, trying to impress their father, trying to um, show dominance in boardrooms with Frank and Carl and and the whole lot. And Shiv felt like, you know, because she was smart, she could just stroll in to, you know, corporate headquarters and declare herself, you know, a, a leader of the company. And I always thought that that was pretty presumptuous and that this idea that the thing that held her out of the leadership of that company was her gender. It was just kind of a self-serving assumption there. I mean, she made a choice to build her own life. And that's great. And that's something that I had respect for the character over. But you can't make choices and expect only to get the good part of the consequences of those choices, and be exempt from the bad part. So that was part of my love-hate relationship with Shiv from the start. It's like, why do you think that you just get to stroll in here after declaring yourself suddenly interested in this company um, and be in charge? One of the things that you said at the very start that I wanted to revisit is this idea of 
how do we think about feminism and Shiv Roy? Would Shiv call herself a feminist? And is she acting as a feminist? I think are two really interesting questions. And and I was mulling these in the last couple of episodes. I wrote a couple of pieces about this. And I also think that the reaction from people online, the amount of judgment and analysis of Shiv through the lens of there's some other expectation of her as a woman, I thought was so interesting. So I'm going to say kind of what I think a little bit of the deal is if Shiv is a feminist, and then I would like you to weigh in. Shiv does not hold feminist principles. She does not act in solidarity with other women. She acts for herself. Like we see this in the very first or second season. I can't remember when it happens when she talks that cruise victim uh, of sexual assault out of going forward and and being public about it. So Shiv is incredibly self-interested. And I don't think that it's reasonable to say that just because a woman is upset because she is being penalized in some way because she's a woman, that means that she's a feminist. Like she, she, Shiv is definitely, definitely gets the raw end of the deal because of her gender in comparison to her other siblings. And that's sad. And that is frustrating. And that is all the things that go along with that. But I just felt like this idea that Shiv Roy was a feminist was so absurd. That was just some of our Slate Plus segment. If you want to hear the whole thing, go to slate.com slash the waves plus to become a Slate Plus member today. Slate.com slash the waves plus. 